good to see you guys again. Got another video for you today. We're gonna to be working on the little XR80 back here. This is my girlfriend's bike. Honestly, I wish I was working on the CR250 back here. Uh, we're waiting on a few things coming from overseas and once that stuff shows up, it's game on and that bike will pretty much be done. So really excited about that. Speaking of the 250, did a little giveaway a few videos back on some red radiator hoses that I had, some extra ones. And so I'm gonna pick the winner for those later in the video. So make sure you stick around for that. And as far as myself, lately I've just been kind of kicking back, taking it easy, and just recovering the last little bit. This previous week, my girlfriend and I went to Oregon, just hung out by the beach for a couple days, took in some fresh air. And now that I'm back, I'm feeling a lot better. Honestly, this is the best I felt in probably a year and a half or two years. Really good feeling, everything is looking up good. Got the beard coming in strong. Some uh, pretty crazy hair gains up there. It's crazy, the hair is coming back a different color. It was like uh, strawberry blonde before, now it's pretty much brown. So uh, I don't really know what to think about that. But yeah, so expect to see a lot more videos coming your way soon. Now for the XR80, what we did in the previous video is kind of clean it up, get it running good, fix the sloppy linkage, and now just gonna add some modifications to it and kind of personalize it. Didn't tell Haley I was doing any of this, so this is gonna be a complete surprise to her. What I'm gonna do is pull the wheels off the bike, bring them all the way down to the hubs, and do some powder coating. I think that's the one mod that makes the biggest difference in the looks on a bike. Pretty excited to do it. So it's a pretty simple task to pop the wheels off this bike. Pretty much just slide the axles out and get the chain off the sprocket. Got the wheels off the bike, and honestly, these bearings didn't really feel too good. The front's definitely pretty stiff, and the rears felt a little bit loose on the bike. Yeah, got a little bit of play in there. Good thing we're replacing those, and uh, could use some fresh rubber as well. So the next step is gonna be to pull the sprocket off as well as the tires, and I'm gonna be using a tire changing stand for this, along with these, uh, tire levers. Both the lever and the tire changing stand are Tusk brand from Rocky Mountain. I've had these for probably three or four years now and uh, been really happy with them. For the sprocket bolts, I find it easier to loosen up the nut on the backside first before trying to get like an impact or a Allen wrench on the, the hex head. This saves you from stripping out the head. And looking at the sprocket, you can see at the top of each tooth, it's getting a little bit thin and it's starting to hook a little bit. So it is time to replace the sprocket. Now the steps for pulling off the tire are gonna be loosening up the valve stem and the rim lock and letting all the air out of the tube. Got this little valve stem core remover. Just goes in right here at the valve stem and you pull the core out and all the air escapes from the tube. Now we're just going to take the nut off the rim lock here and that will release the tire or kind of free up the bead of the tire from the rim. So by pushing in the rim lock, this allows us to push the bead of the tire down inside the rim. Just going to make sure the bead is off all the way around the rim. I'm going to start the rim lock and push the bead of the tire down on the opposite side of the rim. Kind of give me some room over here. Pull this over, take the other tire lever, go on the other side of the rim lock, work it in. And there's a lot of rust inside this tire here. And then I'm just gonna simply work my way around the tire. And the, the trick to this is keeping the bead of the tire down inside the rim. That'll allow you enough, enough room to get this tire off. One side's off, flip it over. Again, just gonna start the rim lock here. What I like to do is pull both sides of the tire over the rim. That way the rim is like sitting inside of the tire. Now this side of the tire is gonna be a lot easier than the first side. It's already loosened up quite a bit. 
And then what I'm gonna do is find the rim lock right here, go opposite of that, get this tire lever in underneath the tube. I'm gonna work the lever all the way down to the other side of the rim and just kind of pry it like this to get some space right here. This will allow us to work the tire off the rim. So that's about as far as we're gonna get with that. And now you can just simply push the tire down. And just work the tire right off of there. Pretty straightforward. Now it's time for the front tire. That one's gonna be super easy to do. All right, I'm gonna see if I can get this one done in under a minute. That might be kind of a kind of a big ask, but let's go for it. Not too bad. That was pretty close. Now the next step is going to be to separate the hub from the spokes and the rim. Since I'll be powder coating the, the actual hub here and the rim. And I'll also need to pull the bearings and seals out of the hub as well. So I'm going to do that first actually. Now this is what I use for pulling out the bearings. It's called a blind bearing puller kit. It's like a slide hammer and it's got these individual little collets that slide right into the bearing. Just pop right in there. You tighten these two against each other and pretty much just locks that adapter to the bearing. And then you use the slide hammer to yank that out. Pretty simple. So I've got one side bearing out and one thing I thought I'd mention here is this is a really common issue with the little Hondas from 50cc all the way through like 150cc. The brake side bearing likes to wear out the hub to where it's like basically sitting in there, not a press fit anymore, you can pull it out with your fingers. Looks like this one's in there pretty good. Uh, basically what happens is when you have a bigger rider on the bike or the bike is being beaten on, um, the bearing will kind of wallow out the hub here. And at that point, uh, you're gonna have to replace the hub or fix it somehow. So something to keep in mind when you're working on those little Hondas. I'm always impressed with how well that bearing puller works. Pretty slick tool. So this is a Tusk brand from Rocky Mountain as well. You guys probably know it's a common theme here. Pretty much everything I get tools wise and parts wise is from Rocky Mountain. No joke, they've got the best prices and best selection around. Definitely worth checking them out. I'll actually link everything I'm using throughout this little project down below in the description. What we're gonna do next is strip these wheels all the way down to the hubs. Now this is gonna be kind of time consuming, but at least we get to twist some nipples here. So we're gonna be using a spoke wrench for this. This one has a couple different sizes on it. Make sure it fits all the way onto that nipple and is a tight fit. These nipples strip pretty easily. So we're gonna go all the way around the wheel, loosen up each nipple half a turn or more at a time. And then once those are loose, go over to the back side. I'm gonna put a Phillips head on the impact and loosen up these nipples the rest of the way with that. Now before you take the wheels all the way apart, it's always a good idea to take some pictures or video as to how the pattern is and uh, which spoke goes where. It'll save a lot of hassle when it comes to lacing the wheels again.
Now for the front wheel, we might have three different spoke styles. You can see one side of the hub is thinner than the other. So obviously these spokes are gonna be longer than the ones on this side. And then we have an inside and an outside spoke. So an outside spoke, let's pull it out and take a look at it. And compare it versus an inside spoke. Let's see if there's any difference to it. Measure them up against each other. No, it actually looks like they're the same. I don't see any difference in the angle of the head or the length, so no need to worry about that. That might not be the case on this other side. Pull an outside spoke and an inside one. Looks like those are the same as well, same length and same angle. So all we need to do is separate the right side spokes from the left side. We're definitely gonna have an inside versus an outside style spoke on the rear. I'm gonna pull an outside spoke here. I'm gonna compare that versus an inside. So they're about the same length, but on the head you can see one has a bit longer head and a different angle. So this one here is an outside and this one is an inside. And it looks like the hub is the same diameter on both sides so we won't need to separate those. Just need to separate inside versus outside. Now with the wheels all the way apart, we have one last thing to pull off the bike to get ready for powder coat. I think it would look a little bit funky if I had the hubs powder coated and the brake panels left silver. So I'm gonna pull these off and prep them. So it looks like the rear panels held on just with this nut. I'm gonna compress the spring, spin that nut off of there. For the front panel, I'm gonna go up to the lever, give it as much cable slack at the bottom as possible. It's gonna spin the adjuster all the way in. And then down here at the panel, all I need to do is loosen up these two nuts on the cable, and then I can pop the cable off the arm here. Now the last thing we'll have to pull off the brake panels will be the brake shoes and the brake arms. So now we've got everything stripped down and ready to sandblast and these are the parts I'll be powder coating. So I just need to clean them up with the degreaser that way the dirt and grime doesn't contaminate my sandblaster here. Oh and by the way check out this little Z50 I picked up today. Saw it on Craigslist for 250 bucks. So I was like, can't really pass that one up. This thing is hammered pretty good, but I think it would make a fun little project down the road. I just can never pass up cheap deals like this. Got everything cleaned up and ready to sandblast. So I thought I'd show you my little sandblasting setup here. This is about the cheapest setup you could get. Just a Harbor Freight benchtop unit with some 120 grit um, aluminum oxide. Got a regular shop vac hook up, hooked up to it. And then over here is the air compressor. Just a tiny little Harbor Freight 30 gallon one. So yeah, nothing too fancy, but it does the trick. All right, let's get to sandblasting. All right, I've got the hubs all sandblasted. And now for the rims, since these are chrome plated, I wanna use a more aggressive media, something like 60 or 80 grit aluminum oxide. Now the media is not gonna actually strip the chrome off the rim. It's only gonna etch it. I've done this time and time again on chrome rims and it's always worked really good. Just powder coat right over the uh, etched chrome and there's no issues there. So I ended up sandblasting only the inside part of the rim here. I'm gonna do the um, face of it with a rough scotch right wheel. I want that roughed up really good because um, the outer surface is where it's most prone to chipping. And of course I can get to it with the, uh, with the scotch right wheel whereas the inside is a little, uh, a little tougher to get to. So I will be using this rough scotch Brite wheel on a bench grinder here. Um, if you're gonna be doing any metal grinding, especially when you're working with chrome, you wanna make sure you have good ventilation like an exhaust fan. And 
you're absolutely wearing a respirator like this style here. So here's what it looks after using the Scotch-Brite pad. It ripped right through the chrome and the powder coat should have no problem sticking to that. It's got a nice textured feel to it and the uh, powder coat will ad adhere to that really good. So I ended up doing the inside of the rim as well. I figured while I was at it, see if I can get in there. It actually worked out pretty good. So I should have just started with the Scotch-Brite pad from the get-go. I think I spent probably three or four hours sandblasting these whereas it took maybe 20 minutes with the Scotch-Brite pad. The sandblaster is usually my go-to, but for something like this, I would rather use a Scotch-Brite pad, something as rough as this one. This definitely did the trick. If you guys don't have a sandblaster and you need something for paint prep, I will have these ones linked down below. All right, now we're ready to do some actual powder coating, probably the part of the video you guys all wanted to see anyways. So. To prepare for powder coating, I'm gonna blow all these parts off with the air compressor, and then I'm gonna soak the hubs in acetone. Just got a plastic bucket here, and you wanna make sure, if you're using a plastic bucket, that it doesn't melt with acetone. There's certain plastics that can hold up to acetone, and it'll say on the bottom of the plastic or the bucket here. So HDPE is a type of plastic that won't melt with acetone and it says it or it's stamped right here on the bucket so we're safe with this one so i've got everything soaking in there i'm gonna leave it in there for about 30 to 45 minutes and the acetone will eat away any oil dirt or leftover grease it'll have everything sparkling clean and ready for powder coating and you definitely want to make sure you cover up the bucket or else that acetone will uh, start to evaporate out pretty quickly. All right, 45 minutes later, these parts are done soaking. So I'm gonna make sure I have a fresh set of gloves on so that way I don't contaminate the part or the acetone. Pull them out, blow them off, let them dry off, and then I'll need to mask off a few areas. So I'm gonna put the hub and the brake drum together when I powder cut them, just like this. So that way I don't need to mask off the drum or the bearing race side. But on this side, I'll need to mask off this um, bearing bore. And on the drum, let's see here, I'll need to plug that. Probably mask, yeah, I'm gonna mask the inside of here off. And I'm gonna put a plug in that hole as well. So here's what I'm gonna be using to mask off and plug the critical areas on the parts. Got some silicone plugs and some tape obviously made to withstand the heat of the oven. I'll have these linked down below. So I ended up just masking off these holes instead. It turns out a lot cleaner instead of using the plugs. So when you mask off a hole, you gotta do a little relief cut in there because when you run it through the oven, the heat will actually kind of shrink the tape and the tape will start peeling up around the edges. So make sure you do that. And then uh, got that little section masked off. And when you're doing this masking, especially after you're done uh, soaking the part in acetone, you gotta use fresh gloves. That way the oil on your skin doesn't contaminate the part. Now we just gotta mask off the hole on this side and we will be ready for a preheat through the oven with this part. I'd say this side turned out pretty good. I love the look of those clean cuts. It's gonna make for some nice powder coating lines. Now on this side, we're gonna wrap some tape around the back side of the panel here. That way it fits inside the drum and doesn't fall out and just fits in there snugly and doesn't shift around when we're powder coating. Go ahead and test this, make sure it's in there firm. Oh yeah, that'll do. So now I'm gonna preheat the part through the oven at 450 degrees for 30 minutes. Just gonna hang the part from a rack using these wires here. 
So preheating the part burns off any remaining oil or residue and uh, just cleans up the surface. So what we have here is just a regular household oven. I think I got it on Craigslist for like 50 bucks, but you definitely don't want to use the oven that you're going to be cooking food in. You want to have a dedicated powder coating oven. The part's all done with the preheat process and while it's cooling off, I'm going to set up my powder coating gun here. The gun I'm using is an Eastwood hot coat. It's the original one, not the dual voltage. Still works really good. It's a nice, uh, simple gun. So basic concept is we've got power from an extension cord leading up to the box. And then we've got the ground. This grounds to the part. And then the button, this activates the charge on the part, which allows the powder to stick. And then the gun itself. And you want a regulator on your gun. So the powder goes in this cup. The cup screws onto the gun and you have air pressure coming from an air compressor. And then once you get it all hooked up, just hit the trigger. You got powder coming out the end. Pretty simple deal here, nothing too complicated. And for powder, I'm using Prismatic. Best powder in the game in my opinion. Powder plays a huge role in how well your project comes out, so you better choose wisely. The color we're going with on these hubs is a red. So it's gonna be like an anodized look. So basically, we use a chrome base and then a red translucent or a red transparent color over the chrome. And that's how you achieve the anodized look with powder coating. So like I said, the first coat is the chrome. It's actually a really cool look in itself, but you have to put some sort of coating over it, whether that's a clear coat or like a color in this situation. So I'll open up the bag and show you what the powder looks like. Yep, just powder, looks like powder. If it looks like powder, moves like powder, it's probably powder. So we're gonna take a spoon, fill up this container about a third of the way. This project really isn't gonna take too much powder. Screw that cup onto the gun and we can get spraying. All right, we've got the powder in the gun. The gun is hooked up to the air. Power supply is plugged in. Just need to ground to the part. Shit. We're gonna go right to the wire that the hub is hanging from. Gonna make sure the gun's shooting out powder. All looks good. And one last thing before I start shooting powder, you absolutely have to wear some sort of breathing protection. These things are only like 20, 25 bucks from Home Depot. Absolutely necessary. And I would definitely recommend having ventilation in your shop as well and eye protection is a plus too. So definitely gotta protect yourself. And when I'm spraying out the part, I want the exhaust fan to be pulling the powder away from me and not towards me. So I'll be doing the majority of the spraying from this side of the part. Man, it sure is nice having that exhaust fan in here. You can literally see all the powder just being sucked right out and it's not even landing on the floor at all. So that's gonna make cleanup and uh, safety a lot better. So I'm gonna check this thing over real quick before I pop in the oven, make sure I didn't miss any spots. Basically, you just want it consistent, but without too much buildup. But yeah, looks pretty good. So for this color called Super Chrome, I'll be baking it for 12 minutes at 450 degrees. That's what Prismatic recommends. And I'll be using an infrared heat gun here to check the part's temperature. Once it reaches 450 degrees, I'm gonna leave it in there for 12 minutes. And at that point, we are gonna have some chrome. Let's go ahead and check the temp real quick. Ooh, I see some chrome. We are at 338. So it's gonna need a little bit more time. By the way, do not buy these Harbor Freight infrared heat guns, man. They completely choke, super inconsistent. I don't think I would trust it. So while I've got that chrome cooking in the oven, I'm gonna get the gun all set up with the dazzling red. So when you're switching powders in your gun, you wanna blow all this old powder out, every last bit of it. And it's probably advisable to wear a respirator when you're doing this. You don't wanna breathe any of that in. All right, the 12 minutes is up. Let's pull this thing out and shoot some color on it. That chrome was pretty dang impressive in its own right, just by itself, but not quite the look we're going for. Once we throw some red over it, 
it's gonna look even better. So how I go about spraying a two stage color, it's always tough to get the second coat to stick. A lot of times it'll just uh, dust right off. Basically the part still has to be warm in order for the powder to stick. Part of that being is because that first coat acts as an insulator, so it's hard to get uh, a good ground on the part. And the other part is because the gun I'm using is a single voltage, whereas the dual voltage guns allows for a little more flexibility and makes it a little easier for a second coat. All right, got a nice consistent coat on it, not too thick. It's easy to go overboard and just coat it. That way you, uh, you're you sure you didn't miss any spots. But as soon as we get this in the oven, it's gonna fluidize and turn out really good. I'm excited. We're gonna bake this cake at 400 degrees for 10 minutes. I'm gonna come back in a few minutes and uh, check the part temperature, make sure I get it up to temp. Sheesh, would you look at that. Pretty pumped on how it came out. Hard to beat the look of that. Looks like we got a little bit light up top with the red here, but you know what? It's pretty hard to get it perfect. I think that's gonna look pretty sweet on the bike though. So one thing to keep in mind when you're spraying that second coat is if you spray it really heavy, you're gonna end up with a really dark or like a deep color. And on top of that, that powder is gonna build up in areas like where the cable mounts and where it rides on the fork and then like in all the spoke holes too. And it's gonna be pretty tough to put anything together if it's really thick. So only put on enough to get some color out of it and don't really go too much farther than that. So I've got the front hub all finished up, peeled all the masking tape off and cleaned up all of these edges with the scalpel. So if you have powder that gets behind some of the tape or in areas where you don't want it, you can just uh, trim all that up with the scalpel. So now it's on to the rear hub. Get this thing busted out so we have a matching set. If you're powder coating a rear hub, one thing to keep in mind is you may want to mask off the sprocket mounting surface. That way that powder buildup doesn't affect how the sprocket mounts. Got the rear hub all sprayed out with the chrome. I think it's really important to develop a spray pattern. That way you have a consistent finish and there's complete coverage on the part. So what I'll do is I'll start on the outermost edge of the hub, kind of work my way in, just work one, one edge at a time. And as I'm spraying, I'll spray in like a circular pattern, like make the tip of the gun um, like the size of a baseball. So like I said, I started on the outermost part, moved to this edge, went behind it, did this, this face here, and then the center portion and then the other side. By spraying in a circular pattern, that ensures you have consistent powder coverage. You'll notice with metallics or like specialty colors, if you spray just like a spray gun, like, you know, left to right, up and down, you'll have lines in the powder or lines in the metallic. Doesn't matter so much on a solid color, but just a good method to develop in the case you ever use a metallic color. So like I was saying earlier, the powder you choose has a huge effect on how well your project's gonna turn out. If you guys remember a long time ago, my first powder coating videos, this was probably like seven or eight years ago, I wanna say, back when I was in high school, it was that long ago. Um, I was having a lot of issues with getting the correct color and doing uh, two stage powders like we're doing today. And just a whole host of issues that were actually powder related. I mean, some of it was user error, just learning but I feel like a lot of it could have been corrected just using a quality powder. And so since then, I've jumped around to a bunch of different companies and uh, the one I've settled on, the one I like the best is Prismatic. They're always spot on with their color. Not a problem at all doing two sage colors like translucence, transparence, and they're right down the road for me in Oregon too. So everything's really quick to show up at my doorstep. And one thing I will say is when you use a crappy powder, and you have a bad result and you try to strip it off, it ends up being a ton of work. You have to use paint stripper, you have to sandblast it again, 
it ends up being just a complete disaster. So I definitely recommend finding a quality powder, that way you don't end up redoing stuff. It's the worst, I tell you what. So I'll link the company I use for powder down below in the description. So I'm peeling the masking tape off this rear brake panel and I thought I'd show you guys just how thin the powder coat buildup actually is. So I've got a piece of masking tape with the powder on it. This is two layers, the chrome and the red. Just look how thin that actually is. I'm gonna measure it just for uh, curiosity's sake. Wow, I didn't realize powder coat was actually that thin. Surprise me. Maybe I don't actually need to do that much masking. Pretty dang pumped how these things came out. What do you guys think? On the next go round with rear hub, I think I'm gonna try not masking off the the uh, sprocket mounting surface here. Now that I realized how thin powder coat actually is, I think I could get away with it. The biggest problem with masking it off is having this open edge here just makes it more prone to chipping. And I think I could get away with not masking this portion off as well. So the areas you definitely have to mask off are the bearing surfaces and then where the brake shaft goes through the panel as well. You do not want powder in there. Now for the rims, I'm just gonna wipe them down with acetone on a cotton reg. Don't wanna use a paper towel. That will leave uh, some lint behind. And then I'm gonna pop them in the oven for the preheat process. So to hang the rim from the rack, I'm gonna use three of these wire hooks and I'll have to modify them a little bit. That way they don't hit the edge of the rim. You can see when I have it like that, it's touching the edge. So I'm gonna bend them, put like a, a flat spot at the bottom here, something like that. And that'll prevent the wire from touching the rim. If this uh, wire is touching the rim, it'll leave like an indent in the powder. So the rim's out of the oven, all cooled down and ready to spray. Got the gun all loaded up with powder. The color I'll be going with on this rim is called a stone black. It's a just a satin black with no metallic, no texture. So pretty basic color. And by the way, I'm just spraying everything on this clothes hanger. Gives me a lot of room to get in there and spray. So it works pretty good. So I went pretty thick with the powder on this one. Rims get a lot of abuse, so you want a pretty solid layer on there. I'm gonna stuff this one in the oven and see how it turns out. I'm gonna be baking this one at 400 degrees for 10 minutes. The powder is all done baking, and I would say it turned out pretty good. Got a nice satin finish to it. Now I'm gonna bust out the back rim, and we'll be all finished up powder coating. This powder coating job turned out damn good. Pretty pumped to get these together and see how they look on the bike. Okay, so three things to keep in mind if you're gonna be doing powder coating at home and you wanna get the most out of it. Number one is surface prep. You gotta either scotch bright it, sandblast it, or wire wheel it, and then soak it in acetone and run it through the oven for a preheat process. Number two, use a good gun and good powder. I'll link the ones I use down below in the description. Number three is Get an infrared gun, like the temp gun, so that way you know you're curing the powder properly. So that's about it for this video. In the next one, we're gonna be popping in some fresh bearings, lacing up the wheels, truing them, putting on some fresh rubber, and doing some chain and sprockets. So keep your eyes out for that one. And before I forget about it, gotta pick the winner for the CR250 radiator hoses from a few videos back. So let's do that right now. We're just racking up the comments here, see how many we got. 1449, you guys killed it on that one. It's gonna go down here and hit start. So I had you guys comment, make CR250s great again. Whoever's name pops up first, you are the winner. Looks like we got AZ Off-Road. He says, make CR250s great again. So AZ Off-Road, send me a message on Instagram. I'll put my username right up here at the bottom of the screen. Send me a message with your shipping address and I'll get those radiator hoses out to you. Congrats, man. Really hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you got something out of it, all I ask of you is to share the video. My whole goal with the channel is pretty simple, just to help people, whether that's enabling them to work on their own dirt bikes, start a business related to dirt bikes or powder coating or Cerakoting, whatever it is, 
or just simply providing some free entertainment for you. This video probably ended up being like 30 or 40 minutes long and typically these videos take me anywhere from like 15 to 20 hours to produce. So all I ask in return is that you share the video. Either post it on Facebook, post it on Instagram, share it on your story, or just go tell someone in person. I appreciate it all. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, keep her prime.